Well, good afternoon to you and welcome to the show. Thank you for joining. My name is Alex MacPhail and this is High Performance Teams. Well, I've got a fascinating guest for you today. Kevin Ellis grew up in the Air Force, a child of an Air Force helicopter pilot, became an Air Force helicopter pilot and has had an amazing story over the last couple of years. So please stand by for uh, Kevin's story. Straight in from Kenya. How are you doing today, Kevin? No, well, thanks, Alex. How's it? Laka, thank you. Well, thanks for taking the time out. I know you're actually part of a Medibac crew on standby and you've uh, carved out a bit of time for us to have this conversation. There's a lot of people joining the show and, uh, and thank you for doing that. Tell me, are you guys uh, full on flat out working conditions? Is, how is the lockdown or the, the COVID pandemic um, working for you guys at the moment? Well, yeah, the Kenyan government essentially uh, instituted a similar lockdown to South Africa in certain areas of the country. It's not uh, dark. So that has affected operations a bit, obviously slowed down slightly, but otherwise it's uh, business as usual. Just waiting for a call. <laughs> okay. And being a, a contract worker, I know your family's in, in Cape Town at the moment and you're on contract uh, you know, on and off working and, and off time. Uh, at this point, do you, if you're on contract, do you just stay on contract, or is there still a defined end time and you can get home after a few weeks? Um, right now, the COVID story is uh, a little up in the air. There's no defined end point that <laughs> oh, takes to come. Um, if it's going to to end, we will definitely jump on a plane and come home. But uh, right now, I'm not sure. <laughs> okay, all right, we'll leave Should it there. Should have been a month ago. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, well, I'm sure that the people are very help, uh, thankful that you are helping out and continue to provide that service of Medivac. But let's, uh, let's rewind a little bit, Kevin. Uh, we were in Langoban at the same time learning to fly. But before then, you are a child of the Air Force. So, so tell me about your childhood growing up with your father as an Air Force pilot. You lived in Ndangwa uh, for two years in uh, Pretoria and you ended your time as an Air Force child in the Test Flight Development Center in Bredasdor. Tell me about your career watching helicopters and your father flying about? Yeah, no, definitely. My passion for the Air Force and the helicopter flying definitely is from my dad. Uh, I really remember a few trips to back then when 19 squadron was at uh, Squad Corps. Um, and uh, yeah, it was a fascinating time and uh, you know, the bug bit me. And from, from, the, from the age of probably Five, I just knew that uh, this is what I want to do is fly helicopters and yep and just grew from there then uh, as the years went on obviously that was the main focus aviation in my life and uh, went down to the Cape and obviously seeing a bit more about the Air Force at TFDC and what they did was more of inspiration and uh, yeah end of school came drifted around for a year as a bombing back to the Air Force semi-successful then. Uh, I went past everything except that uh, they didn't want me at the time. And then I went televanting to UK for a bit. Came back, started studying at Stellenbosch University and then uh, got a letter saying, am I still interested? And of course I said, oh yes. <laughs> and I went to basics and back, back to Victoria. <laughs> okay, cool. Well, uh, it's uh, quite a common um, occurrence that people apply more than once to get into the Air Force training and uh, glad that you continued and you stuck it out to once selected, uh, you were part of the, the group, um, I remember in Langoban in the time that you were just about to get going and then there was this freeze and a pause on your, your training. You had a couple of weeks off, I think it was a two-month delay if I'm correct. And a bunch of you guys took this as an opportunity yeah. to spend an extended period on the, on the beach, doing extended survival mode, living on a tent on the beach. Tell us a bit about that, uh, the camaraderie and the team spirit going on at that point. Yeah, no, it was, um, it was interesting times. We, obviously, all we wanted to do at that point was start to fly, and, and then to get delayed, it was a real disappointment. But we made the best of it. We had a good bunch of guys, and we, you know, we figured out that we could get the Air Force to we convince the Air Force to allow us to go sit on the beach and dive and surf and fry, have a general good time. And, yeah, so it, was, uh, it was a good team effort. Everyone chipped in and did their bit, and... Uh, yeah, we also went sailing in, uh, in Longobon Lagoon a few times and generally stuck together and made work. 
Okay, that seems to be a central theme of the way you live your life, you know. Present it with something and let's tweak it into something that's a bit more appealing or appetizing and make the best out of it. Okay, so you, you get your, eventually your training does com, uh, continue and you get your wings and you end up in the chopper line. And uh, I, I know throughout your career, you're flying helicopters, there's various um, uh, tours that you go on, deployments to the DRC, to Burundi. In fact, I've got a, a, a picture of one of the, the things that you got up to in Goma. So there's you on your scooter there. You look like a type of guy who just goes out there and makes the best of the situation. There you and your camera is <laughs> pushing around this uh, makeshift wooden scooter in, the, in uh, the DRC. Tell us about these kind of tours. What were they like? Yeah, uh, they were fun. I mean, a great learning experience. Um, and uh, the flying wasn't too bad. It was challenging at times. Um, but generally speaking, as you've seen the photo, there's what I enjoyed a lot about is just getting soaked up with a bit of environment and the local atmosphere and just having a bit of fun with the locals and those guys. Obviously, in the DOC, they use those scooter types to send their wheelbarrows. Uh, they just transfer all sorts of loads around with those. I just asked the guy to give me a go, and it's actually pretty heavy. It's a lot heavier than it looks. <laughs> it was good fun. Yeah. Okay, cool. So is that, is that quite a common sight? That's not a, a once-off. This is what you see all over the place in the traffic, these wheelbarrow scooters. Yeah, yeah. Especially, well, specifically in Goma, I remember. Which, um, so, yeah, it's a you know, it's an ingenious form of the way they just did what they had available. And a couple of car tires. There's a bit of traction on the wood, and the wood, and they build it just completely out of wood. It's just amazing what they can do with, uh, with the resources they have available to them. Okay, well, yeah, I'm going to put another picture up there. You're sitting in front of your United Nations Oryx sitting on the field there. Also, I think it's in the uh, in Goma. Um, so at the time, then you're flying Oryxes, and you're in and out of Africa, various deployments. Um, but then you you decide that after about what is it, 11 years of your time in the, in the Air Force, it's time to move on and and uh, face other horizons. And you've uh, experienced uh, yeah. Antarctica and Iraq and all sorts of different hostile places. Tell me a bit about uh, your time in Antarctica. I'll put a picture up of the being in the snow there on the ship. Yeah, the Antarctic trip was a, a trip of a lifetime. Um, I really enjoyed it. And I actually went down there with my father, which was a fantastic opportunity. So we were crewing the aircraft together. Um, beautiful place. It's, it's amazing. And, you know, it's it's obviously just ice mostly, but it's just absolutely beautiful vistas and it's a great experience and um, something I'll never forget. And uh, I'd love to go back, in fact. It's a challenging environment to operate in. Uh, you know, temperatures in the summer even with a wind chill, minus 30, minus 25. So it's a tough environment to operate in. And, uh, and yeah, definitely a place where, you know, I suppose the team needs to be stick together and do the bits and pieces to make the whole operation move um, forward and, and be efficient. Okay, well, it certainly is. Um, I, I know a couple of people that have done a trip to Antarctica and uh, sentiments are, are similar to what you mentioned. It's just a special place. There's something quite unique about it, the, the sort of natural beauty, even though it's got that harshness to it. You know, there's, there's that common theme of love to go back there again. So, okay, so you've, you've bashed around a bit. You've done Antarctica, yeah, you've been to Antara into Iraq, and then you find yourself on a tour to Somalia, Mogadishu, where you're doing medevac. And uh, tell me what a typical medevac operation Correct. is like. You know, you, you're stuck in a compound because this is effectively a war zone. You're living on the base, uh, on the airport base there in a bit of a compound. Tell us about life in the compound and your typical operation there. Yeah, so the... the uh the base section in Mogadishu was around the airport and, and I imagine it still is today. Um, so they secured the airport so that you can get, continue with the logistics to support the, the UN and the Amazon missions there. So we were, uh, we were directly supporting, the, or we were contracted by the UN, but to support the African Union mission there, um, which was essentially Uganda, majority Ugandan, Kenyan, some Ethiopian troops. Um, to fight back Al Shabaab in the in, in the central part of Somalia, and so on the compound itself, you, you live in sort of containers um, with your with the, the other crews, and you know you typical you know, sit around and wait a bit for a job to come in, and then the job comes in, off you go, scoot over to the aircraft, get it prepped, get out there, go pick up the guys. Where they, you know typically where these guys are operating in the Quite deep in the bush and uh, very primitive conditions, tough conditions for the guys to work in. 
And uh, yeah, I take my hat off to those, those poor guys on the ground there. They, uh, they really had a rough and tough guys. You know, when he got a bullet wound in his head, comes to walking to the aircraft, you know, he's, a, he's, he's not a soft guy. <laughs> he can handle a few, can handle a bit of punishment. Yeah, well, I mean, it sounds like even you, you, you're there as support and relief crew, and you're not kept in the, in the most comfortable of conditions. That, I mean, uh, it's, it takes quite a commitment to, to be able to operate living in a container and in that sort of strict lockdown, effectively semi-war zone. So I think tough guys all around. I know you weren't necessarily the one taking the bullets to the head, but, uh, but still, I think even your crew, a bunch of tough people. Kevin, I want to um, uh, play yeah, this. Maybe, maybe. I want, I want to play this. There's that video that was shared on YouTube uh, a couple of years ago by the, the, the crowd that assisted you and uh, as a way to kick off the conversation about your swimming and, uh, and uh, body surfing that day. So just uh, stand by for this moment, this clip. Body surfing in that, okay. that three foot wave. And, uh, and then uh, I sort of just put a wave in, been bashed around a bit by the wave and I was in the whitewash and then I felt this brush against my right leg and I thought I'd hit a rock and uh, I was quite confused because I knew there weren't any rocks really in that area I was diving and about 30 seconds or so later I felt a, a sharp cut on my right calf and I realized geez I must have it must be a rock here I've cut myself down this rock and then I was put, put my hand down to feel between my legs for this rock and I put my hand onto an object well, it was rough and I thought oh it is a rock and at that moment the rock bit my left leg <laughs> yeah, I, I received a phone call, I think about five o'clock, um, to tell me that Kevin was attacked by a shark. And eventually I thought it was okay, fine. Um, little sort of leg a little bit mangled, you know, it'll be all right. Later that evening I got a phone call to let me know that he's lost his leg. And, and there was quite a, quite a shock. So I think the media thought is, you know, what will happen to him, especially because he's such an active guy. and. Um, you know, he enjoys his, you know, running and cycling. From the first meeting with Kevin, it is clear for me to note that he, we were dealing with a highly motivated, highly intelligent individual. And I needed to plan his prosthetic prehab and rehab accordingly. Um, from a prosthetic perspective, we started feeding Kevin with lots of information. Uh, we showed him uh, websites with all the different uh, microprocessor needs. Uh, Kevin needed continual stimulation. So as soon as he was well enough, we had him in the gym. He exercised five times a week with our physiotherapist. And it was all about making sure that Kevin would maximize his time while waiting for the medical conditions that he had, the slight sepsis that he had, the skin graft that wasn't taking on the opposing calf. While waiting for all of that to heal, he needed to know that he was doing as much as he possibly could uh, to ensure a highly functional prosthetic fitting. Well, there's a bit of a, an introduction to the story. Okay, so you're on this um, uh, medevac tour. It's a nice hot day. And as you've done many times in the past, you go out uh, body surfing and spend time in the ocean. And as, you, as you've described in that video there, I want to just spend a minute there on, you know, what are your thoughts going through your head? You've, you've got this uh, uh, pain in the one leg and uh, the seemingly rock biting your other leg. Now you're out in the sea and presumably you, you're you know, a couple hundred meters out trying to get someone's attention. Are there people around you? Yeah, there was, there was a few people, um, you know, that part of the, the base was quite popular in the afternoon for the especially the Ugandan troops that were off duty to come and just relax and uh, just get their minds off the conflict and just, you know, chill out. And uh, so we would typically go in the afternoons, go for a surf or a body surf anywhere and swim. And, uh, yeah, there were always people around. So, you know, when, when, uh, when events, when the, the attack happened, I was trying to wave them down and say, you know, hey, I need a bit of assistance here. And, you know, they thought I was just, waving at them and they give me big waves back and saying, how's this? <laughs> so I realized then that I was probably on my own, yeah? And I wasn't on my own in the water. So, you know, in a brief moment of uh, grief and I decided, well, if you're going to survive this, you better swim. And uh, so I started swimming and I probably would have given, um, what's it, Michael Phelps a good run for his money that day, I getting him out in the ocean. And yeah, jumped up on, try to walk, because, you know, you think you... I don't know, I don't know why I tried to walk because I knew my leg was pretty messed up, but 
we can try to walk in the middle, he fell over. And at that point, uh, a group of Ugandan guys came running over and gave me assistance. So, uh, yeah, thank, thank you to them. I'm sure that the initial reactions really helped a lot to save my life. Okay, so then you, you, they, they've come to the sort of the water, sort of knee deep or so, dragging you out there. And obviously, there's, a, there's chaos. There's, a, I mean, there's blood, there's, a, there's trauma, et cetera. Um, what, what, you know, how do you communicate with them? I mean, obviously, they know this is, this is serious, but I know you had your own vehicle there. You, you told me earlier that you, you said, listen, guys, let's just get me to the car. So they get you to the car, and what's, what's happening next? So, yeah, so I'd hit the keys, in the, so they broke into the car. So when I get, so I'm being carried on the way to the, so they pick me up and help me out and they towards the vehicle to get to the hospital. And I sort of momentarily just, uh, um, out there. So obviously they stick, my head was above the, all the blood was rushing out the legs. And so, so I grayed out, got in the car, laid me down, all the, obviously, uh, blood came back to the brain. I began more, uh, conscious. And then I was trying to explain to him where the keys were. And there's obviously, there's five guys helping and about what felt like 400 taking photos um, and a big commotion in the background. So every time I say something, it's amplified, repeated by 10 other people. The same guy fetch this and then if they bring the wrong thing, I'm trying to explain where the keys are so we could just get the car started and get to the hospital. But uh, yeah, so it was a bit of chaos, definitely. But uh, there was at least one guy that was very level head, or one or two guys that managed to impromptu tourney K on the and use my t shirt to to cut the blood uh, cut off the blood and reduce the, the bleeding, which help. So yeah, definitely a lot of chaos in, in the first moment. And are you are you kind of drifting in and out of consciousness at this point or are you still still mostly with it? No, well it's two seconds that they were carrying me to the vehicle. Um I was pretty much with it. Um I was Surprisingly, quite, um, I was quite aware of what was happening and, and what needed to happen, and I was busy barking a lot of instructions. And I suppose the true nature of me, I was pretty getting pretty aggressive and trying to get things going in the way I wanted to go. Um, and luckily, unbeknownst to me, there was another another person that uh, another EU member, or EU team member, that got fetched an ambulance. I uh, wasn't actually driving the vehicle that I had uh, at the beach day. Put me in an ambulance and, uh, yeah, and we sort of drifting, sort of moving towards the, the hospital at that point. But <laughs> okay, a little, well, more, a little more interesting then. For 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 the squeamish uh, viewers, I just I'm going to put a picture up now just to highlight the the crew that was helping him. But uh, I suggest if you're not interested in looking at um, blood etc., then just look away now. I'll just put up for a short while. So there's a picture of the crew. There's that uh, UN person with his um, the uniform on, and uh, they're helping you out the water there. Obviously, there's a bit of blood, but you've got a gash in, uh, in your right leg as well, which is where all the blood's coming from at, at this point, and they're assisting you. Okay, so they get you back into this other vehicle now, and, uh, and now it's a case of ambulance, let's go. Yeah, so you think, um, so I get loaded into this ambulance, and, you know, it's obviously a, a little traumatic for anyone to see the, the injuries. So the, the, the chip in the back of the ambulance, I'm assuming it was a, paramedic of sorts. Uh, he was pretty fast, um, but he was trying to find, he was trying to get, put an IV line in me, and what he had in one hand was the, the needle, in the other hand he had the bag, but he didn't have the line between the two, and he was delaying the departure until he could get, get the line. He was scratching around the back of the ambulance with his line, and, and I was being pretty stern and borderline abusive to him, like, let's get going, because, you know, I'm dying, you know? And he said, no, he's going to get the, get the ID in you. He went, you know, I said, look, rude. The hospital's just down the road, one kilometer, let's go. And uh, I can't remember if we actually got the line in place, but we started moving. And uh, then the ambulance stopped again. And I was like, okay, this is not good. Why are we stopping? And they said, no, they just need some directions. <laughs> so I just started barking from the back there. I'll give you directions. Let's drive. <laughs> so, yeah, it was a, it's amazing how focused you get on surviving and getting what people want out of you when you when you're pretty desperate. I was, uh, yeah, I just knew that I needed to get there quickly because okay. I was leaving out of the rapid tape. Okay, so at this point uh, you've managed to have enough sense about you that uh, there's a few critical things. Let's get there quickly, and eventually the team does get you to the hospital yep. and they get to stabilize you. And uh, and and is this a field hospital uh, or is what type of a hospital is this? It's, no, it's more than a field hospital. So it was the main UN um, medical facility uh, in Mogadishu. 
So they were well, they were well equipped to deal with trauma, and in fact, that's what they've been doing. Especially when you bring in when you fly the guys in from the, from the uh, interior into the into Mogadishu, we order them back to Mogadishu, they go to that hospital. So yeah, so it was well equipped. I don't know what level is, but it it was equipped enough to deal with pretty serious trauma injuries. So this is the same hospital. Same hospital life. Yeah, you were you were bringing your the Kazakh uh, injured soldiers. Is this the same hospital? Now you're lying in the same beds there with the people you would have brought in on the helicopter. Okay. okay. All right. So I know then they stabilize you okay. there overnight, and then uh, obviously the the idea is to get you to a place they can look after you properly. And the first um, mission is the the next morning they take you through to Kenya to get checked out whether you can survive the sort of five hour okay. flight from from Kenya back to Cape Town. I know your wife is pushing quite hard at this point to bring you back home. So. Tell me about what's going on with you and your family and the, and the discussions and arrangements and, and uh, in Nairobi, hoping to get home. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, it's pretty emotional at the time, you know, to, to break the news and chat to your wife on the phone. And, you know, you got a little young kid, not even one years old. Um, rough time for, for her, but she, she did well and um, managed to motivate uh, I'm excited so to get me to, to be medevac all the way down to Cape Town. I'm initially then the plan was to leave me in Nairobi for until I was well enough to probably go back commercially. Which would have meant probably a two week or at least two week stay in, in Kenya with us without them and so on. So yeah, she was she was being very convincing of the phone to the company and the insurance or and indirectly to the insurance company that agreed to fly me all the way down. So yep. Okay, great. Was, uh, nice to have your home base support team. I, I was pretty doped up um, <laughs> okay. on morphine, so I, was, I wasn't really thinking much other than just getting there. Okay, so the home, home base support team coming through nicely for you there, and thanks to Janine, all credit to her to get you back yeah. there. You get to Cape Town and I uh, believe you're into uh, Vincent Pilotti, and that's where your relationship starts with uh, the recovery, uh, the, fi the proper amputation, the through knee amputation, and, uh, and, and then the, the plan forward. So talk me through your, your sort of first few days there. You know, what are your thoughts going through this? You, I know you mentioned there's a psychologist available. You've got a surgeon. You've got a prosthesis. Uh, there's quite a team then looking after you at this point. Yeah, definitely. So initial, initial interaction was with the surgeon that was going to do the, the official amputation to remove the residual stump. Um, and yeah, I was just, you know, you, at that time you don't know a lot. All you know is the, the more they cut off, the worse it really is. And you don't really want them to cut anything off. But as it turns out, in hindsight, what they did was perfect because if they left a little bit of residual limb there, it would have been, been more complicated. And, uh, I think my quality of life would have been worse off than it is now. So decided to do three knee amputation. And then I met the, the Jason Chin Partners guys, which were really great. Um, you know, they advised me on a few different options. And yeah, I mean, I'd done some research on my own at that time because I knew I'll, I'll probably need some prosthesis of sorts. And I uh, stumbled upon a couple of thick clips of different prosthesis on YouTube. And uh, I knew what I wanted, definitely. Um, just a question of if I could afford it. Luckily, I could. Um, but uh, yeah, so got, at the time, in my mind, is the best prosthesis available, and uh, it's made a big difference in my life. And and then, you know, through the advice of the the prosthetist and and the uh, psychologist, you know, that uh, just steering in the right direction and getting your head right, and that's the most important thing is just getting your, your mental space correct and knowing what you want and how to go forward about it is the key. And at this at this point in time. Okay, I'm just going to put a picture up there. It looks like you're with your physio. You, uh, you don't have any prosthesis on. You're walking along a line on one leg and you've got your hand up uh, with a sort of a balance test. So, uh, yeah, what, what is this uh, process like? Is this, is this a mentally hard thing? Is it physically hard? Is it a combination of the two? Tell me about the, sort of the, the approach to let's get better now. Bearing in mind you've got massive injuries and, and you know, wounds. You've got, I presume, loads of stitches and, and just the trauma of the, the, the cuts and things there as well. Yeah, physically, it wasn't too uh, challenging in, for most parts. Um, it was, I think, it, I think half of that is just conditioning. Uh, make sure you're conditioning for the limb, your the body essentially, and the and the and the, and the or your leftover leg is is, is going to be okay to 
to, to receive the prosthesis and, and start walking again. I mean, at, at that point in time, what you want to do is take a step and, and balance. So it's just conditioning your body to balance one leg and be functional on one leg so you don't uh, incur any other injuries climbing in and out of the shower, for example. Okay. Um, and then and then a bit of strength, just make sure your core is good and strong enough to start walking on the, uh, uh, the prosthesis. So that's the early stages of stuff. Um, mentally wise, well, I mean, I like to think I've always been pretty pretty positive. So I was, I knew that, I mean, what I wanted and where I wanted to go. And I knew at that time that there's no way I'm not flying a helicopter again. And, and I wasn't going to let this injury uh, dictate how I live my life. But I was going to find a way to live my life as, as close as possible to what I had before. I like to think I've achieved 95% of that. Um, bearing in mind these are, you know, there are physical limitations to having a prosthesis. Sure. Okay. And I know then, uh, you know, you, 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 people can hear just the way you talk about things now. You've got that positive attitude. You were a very active, busy guy before and nothing's changed. Well, something's changed, but uh, your approach to life hasn't changed. And, and here's a photo of you back in the cockpit for the first time. And it's been, uh, it's only been a handful of months since the, the accident and you back in there, all smiles, uh, thumbs yeah. up. Uh, tell me about that first flight back in the cockpit. You went with a friend just to try it out. Is that right? Yeah, no, it was a big day. It was a, a massive day. Um, yeah, so it's a lot of nerves leading up to that day because, you know, this would be the telling, this would be really the, the answer whether you can do your, fulfill your work passion that, you, uh, that you've always dreamed of doing, you know. And so prior to that, I jumped in the helicopter on the ground and I, I, just to test it, I'd make sure that the prosthesis would do what it needs to do and wouldn't hook on anything and, and and I was surprised. I was at that point. I was quite surprised how natural it felt, even with the prosthesis on. So I was quite confident it would work. But the proof was in the pudding. And that day when I flew, it was a, a superb day, fantastic day. Okay, so look, it looks like you are all smiles that day. You know, it's kind of beaming right through you there. So it's uh, you lose. You had the accident in the August, and uh, four months later, you've done your flight test again. You're good to go, and. Uh, you're feeling comfortable, and within six months of the accident, you've got your license back again. Yeah, yeah, it was, it, yeah, it was a bit of a process um, convincing them, the CA that I was put to fly, but uh, they did their due diligence and the medical board and etc. And uh, um, yeah, I mean, essentially by March, I, I think it was January. So January, I proved the CA that for. Uh, they had inspected and they were satisfied that I was safe enough and capable of handling an aircraft store. And uh, it took a bit of a process for the medical board to sit and uh, evaluate everything. But, and by March, I got the, the official nod that I was good to go. I had a license in my hand again. Oh, that's awesome. And I've sort of put a picture up there uh, next to you there. You're staring out you're on the rocks, looking at the ocean there with your prosthesis on. Uh, the ocean's pool, it, uh, did it wane at all? Are you still back in the ocean? Is, it, is, it, is there any... Um fear of the ocean or is, is life carrying on and now you know back to the place you love yeah actually that photo is standing looking at the point where i got attacked so i went <sighs> years later went back to my issue and that's exactly the same spot where i was uh uh snacked. um yeah look i knew that i loved spear fishing in the ocean and there's no way this was going to keep me out um and yeah i still spear fish and uh, I think very limited case if I was body surfing in any conditions and something grazed or brushed against my leg, I think I'd have a little heart attack. But anything other than that, I'll be fine. <laughs> oh, wonderful. I think uh, anyone having anything brushing against their leg in the, in the ocean will have a little heart attack, but certainly a, an elevated uh, sense for you. So you, you decided that's it, we're going to carry on. And here's another great photo of you spearfishing there. Uh, one of your mates, there's a few people joining online saying hello. We've got Wati, we've got Puch, we've got uh, Fran, we've got Sibu, we've got uh, Martinez, Johan Stande, all saying hello. And uh, this is you, prosthetic on spearfishing. I would. <laughs> That's a massive fish you just caught there. Tell us about your yeah. experience spearfishing now with your prosthesis. All good. Looks like it. Yeah, no, definitely. I'm enjoying it. Um, at that time, in the photo taken, it was, it was like spearfishing and diving was a, a, a massive sort of skip uh, from, I mean, it's only about a year, it's probably about a year or a year and a half after the, the accident. 
So, you know, diving and is really keeping me sane at that point in time. Um, probably, probably just as well because my wife had murdered me. But, um, yeah, so the ocean has been a, a real, a real therapeutic way for me to go back in, you know, uh, to deal with the issues. Um, and spearfishing, yeah, it's, it's an extreme sport, in, I suppose, in a sense. But, um, yeah, you know, it's, it's, there's a wall, there's a way. You've got to get your head and you, there's, this is a matter of way of finding a way to do it, and I think, I think I'm managing slightly okay. I'm not, <laughs> not diving very hard, but I'm diving enough. Okay. Well, there you mentioned your wife. There's a nice photo of you and Janine. Uh, back on the mountain bike, uh, I know you've got a couple of different prostheses. Uh, is this one the one that you use all the time when you go mountain biking, or do you have the, a specialized mountain biking leg? No, I have a specialized uh, well, yeah, I have a, a dedicated mountain bike leg. It's actually, not as specialized as my everyday leg, but uh, it uh, does the purpose. It's, um, it's designed for high impact sports. Um, actually, it was designed by a guy that was semi professional mountain biker and a professional snowboarder, if I'm, I'm correct. A guy called uh, Brian Bartlett. He lost his leg in a car accident or, or as a pedestrian. He was hit by a vehicle. And it's still a story to mine in the sense that he just felt there wasn't enough out there for, you know, he wanted to live his life as he had before. And he, he ended up designing a leg that he could do snowboarding and parking and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, yeah, and I, a, a good friend of mine connected me up with with, uh, with Ryan. And, uh, yeah, and I got a leg out of the, the guys. And I'm on my second version of that leg now. So it does well. Okay, why is there a second version? Does it wear out or is an improvement done? It was an improvement. Yeah, I mean, like anything mechanical, they eventually wear out. And, you know, they, they, unfortunately, these processes, they uh, have a lifestyle. They're sort of like your leg that regenerates the cells. You know, the bearings wear out and the holes get bigger where they should get bigger and then things start falling apart. So, I don't lost it, unfortunately. Okay, so you, you have a, you have the three leg options. Uh, is it one for the sea, one for the mountain biking impact, and then one your everyday, which you then use for flying? I, I believe your, your flying everyday one is the most sophisticated. So, uh, talk us through a little bit about what what makes it the most sophisticated or how. I know it's electronic and hydraulic. Talk us through that, uh, the main leg. So the, the what's it? The, um, Autobox product, so it's a, a Genome X3. Um, the, it's a microprocessor, and it's actually got uh, to, uh, accelerometers and sensors that pick up the weight distribution in the uh, on the foot, and that communicates to a little microprocessor, which tells uh, hydraulic valves uh, what resistance is required at the time. So, in other words, if you're walking down a slope, it will the knee, so you don't the knee doesn't buckle under you, and you can basically walk down steep slopes. Uh, it also allows you to walk upstairs more naturally than so. If you don't have to hip hike up a stair. You can actually walk uh, foot over foot as you normally would. But there's basically, if, when you do a certain hip um, movement, it will the, the knee knows that that the knee now needs to lock in a ninety degree position. So you put the foot down and then you just extend over that knee. And it won't I won't break any more than uh, by ninety degrees. Um, so it's, it's all these clever little things that 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 make life a lot more easier. I'll definitely reduce makes you more confident in, in day to day life. I mean, when I walk, when I, when I walk on my cycling knee, you know, you can, your confidence in the knee is a lot less because of this, this electronics. So it makes a big difference. And, um, and I suppose it also, you know, that, that, that builds confidence in you and you look more natural. So you feel, you don't feel like uh, you know, um, sticking out as much. Okay. And is it, a, is it the case that you want to protect this uh, very sophisticated knee and you don't put it on the high-impact mountain bike sports? Or is there something that the high-impact leg can, can offer you a better ride opportunity? Or what's the difference there? Yeah, so you can't... Uh, the problem with the... the because you, if you ride through the hydraulics, you basically overheat them. So it's, it's always the heat transfer from the, uh, the hydraulic action. Um, eventually, heat, the, if you cycle with it... Um, uh, in normal mode, where it has gave you assistance, it would overheat. So you, you, to cycle that, you have to put it in a sort of free mode where it doesn't use this. There's a free piston in the body, of, so there's no resistance. So you can ride with that the more advanced knee. Mm-hmm. It's just when you're doing um, sort of making jumps and more technical terrain, you need a bit of you need to be able to ride a bit on on, on the weight. Okay. So so the when you when so when you launch and you land on a jump, the other the the, the, the 
his everyday knee will just buckle, whereas the 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 riding knee, the crossover knee, um, that actually has got elastics and uh, that will keep the legs straight and absorb the, the shock more. Um, so you can ride, you can ride harder and, and more technical training with the other leg. <laughs> well, I'm just I'm laughing and I'm smiling at the same time because the way you're explaining it, I mean you. You're out there, you don't just want to go riding, you don't just want to go mountain biking, you want to go do jumps and shocks and lands and technical terrain, that's fascinating, it's wonderful, it's really, as one of the guys, Jock's commenting, a real Douglas Barter, Kevin, you're a role model, and Putch is saying, uh, are you going to get your cycling legs from the States if SAA is not there to help you? <laughs> oh man. But, but, uh, oh, I guess I'll put you, I've got friends in other young cities. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks, Butch. Yeah, guys, if you want to ask some questions, please uh, fire them through now. Having a great conversation with Kevin about uh, his uh, his technical approach to now cycling and flying and life. And you've sent some great photos here. Let me just put another couple of pictures up um, of your, uh, you know, so current operations now. You're back to, sorry, that was a, 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 an Iraq operation from from back in the day. But here's your current operation at Medivac, uh, your blue overalls of the BK. So tell us about your life life is like for you now flying medevac and uh and with prosthetics and is it is it same old same old now yeah i, I mean it, 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 it took a little bit of adjustment initially to get used to you know where you previously had just your calf muscles um and you know controlling the pedals more than your hip uh with the prosthetic side it's more coming through the hip now and, and it's also like driving a manual car. Um, you know, you just got to teach those muscles now, the different muscles to con uh, gotta get used to the fatigue uh, over a long flight, for example. So that was the biggest difference. And then I suppose with the, uh, all with the awesome ready I mean, the hands is all the same. Nothing changes there. Um, but with the pedals, the finer, it's when you need to make it a little finer uh, adjustment, you're probably using your, your right leg or your right ankle more than you would have in the past just to make the fine adjustments. Mm -hmm. They're just keeping the weight on the left side and and breaking and uh, with the right foot or something. Okay, and so it wasn't it wasn't a major. It was it was a lot easier than I thought it would be, to be honest. Okay. Well, um, with the type of attitude that you've displayed and then you talk about living life, I'm, I'm not surprised that you find it easier than you had wondered. Uh, but in the, And besides the actual flying, uh, life on the compound, I mean, we, we spoke this morning, you went for a nice long ride, mountain biking, uh, up to the normal things, keeping busy, keeping active, keeping fit on the times where you're not flying. Yeah, you have to. I mean, uh, in the dead time, and you've got to keep your mind off on other things. And uh, yeah, I try and keep fit. So when I go ride my mates in, uh, at home, they don't leave me behind. Um, so yeah, it's just, uh, you know, it depends where you are. We've got two bases, one forward base. The forward base is, again, it's more of a sort of prefab stuff set up where you live in air-conditioned containers and out in the, in the sticks, uh, which I actually prefer, to be honest. It's uh, much more rural and my kind of thing in the bush. Um, now we're back in the city, or the town rather. But still, you know, just uh, this daily routine of uh, keeping sane and uh, waiting for the next call. <laughs> well, you got uh, um, some nice photos here. I just want to put a picture up there. I know this photo was taken a while ago with your daughter, but clearly a family man and uh, and daughter and family missing you while you're on these tours. But I know you're doing a, a great job. But you've you've travelled quite extensively around the place, particularly Africa, and uh, and uh, no doubt you will continue to do so. Uh, I'm sure that the adventurous lifestyle of a medivac helicopter pilot uh, that doesn't go away easily. And your brothers joined us saying, uh, Laka Kev, you're a celebrity, the greatest role model a brother could ask for. Cheers from Justin. So that's awesome. <laughs> you really are a great role model, Kevin. It's been wonderful chatting with you. And, that's what it says on the telephone directly to me. <laughs> well, at least it's now here. It's official. It's out there. It's in the public eye. They know that. Uh, in the public. <laughs> uh, Justin looks up to Kevin. You can bribe him more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Kevin, thanks so much for your time and uh, for your base operations allowing you to lock off this time to have this conversation. You are a role model. You're an inspiration to a lot of people more than you know it, most likely. And I hope you con continue with your successes and continue with your adventurous lifestyle. Um, I know you've, you've sent some pictures of, of, of some cycling trips you've done with Ben, some of the pilots course buddies. Keep it up. Enjoy it. And I hope we get another chance to have a chat again. Yeah, thanks, Ben. Keep, keep <laughs> Cheers. Uh. Well, folks, thanks so much for joining. Wonderful conversation with, uh, with Kevin. 
Um, please remember to subscribe, like, share, and particularly this message if you think this will land somewhere nice for somebody who's maybe going through a difficult time and you can just see what difficult times could be for you. Dig deep and uh, you know, remember the mind is the limiting factor here. Until next time, please stay safe. Good man.